Jesus Christ bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. Blessed is the name of the Lord. Good evening. My name is Pastor Andy Davis, and it is my privilege to be leading you in this solemn worship service this evening as we remember the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Almighty God, look with mercy on your family for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and to be given over to the hands of sinners and to suffer death on the cross, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our lesson this evening comes to us from the, John, the Gospel according to John, chapter 19, beginning with the end of verse 16. Listen now for the word of our Lord. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but this man said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing near her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son, then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, In order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Sometimes in conversations with friends, perhaps around the campfire or in a seminary classroom, someone would ask, was it necessary that Jesus died on a cross? Was it necessary that Jesus suffered for our salvation? What if Jesus had died of old age? What if Jesus had received appropriate hospice care? 
What if Jesus died gently? Would our sins still be forgiven? This is a terrible and a frightening, a destabilizing question because it throws into doubt the very heart of Christianity. Was it necessary? Was it necessary that this innocent man who had healed, who had fed, who had taught, who had loved, should suffer, should die, that we may be restored to God? Is it necessary for us that Jesus should experience the depths of pain? That is a question that cannot be answered. For in God all things are possible. And yet the suffering of Jesus, the suffering of God's only begotten Son, balances the scales and releases new possibilities into the world. For the world itself, is a place of suffering. As I read this passage from John, this detail stood out to me. Pilate had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. And he wrote that inscription in Hebrew, in Latin and in Greek. Why in those three languages? In Hebrew, because that was the language of the Jewish people, a people that God had rescued from Egypt, a God that had rescued the people from Babylon, that had brought from slavery into the promised land, had restored had made a covenant with God's people, had commanded the people to care for the poor and the sick, that this people, the, the Jewish people, the Hebrew people, were God's special people here on earth and continue to be God's special people, a people of election. And thus the Hebrew language itself is a sacred and beautiful language. So the Hebrew was the language of the people. But the inscription was not merely written in Hebrew, it was also written in Latin and in Greek. In Greek, because of Alexander the Great, the famed ancient general who marched and sailed from Greece across the Mediterranean world all the way into what is today Afghanistan and India. Alexander the Great, who conquered the known world, at least the world known to him in his day. A man who brought the sword, the destruction of war, surely famine and disease with him wherever he went. The Greek language, a language of a small collection of islands, off of a peninsula became the language of the ancient world. The language that even the Hebrew people spoke and wrote because they too had been conquered by his forces. And Latin, likewise, the language of the empire, the language of the conqueror, the language of the one with the chariots, the horses, the spear, and the sword the language of the ones who brought violence and suffering to the world. And so Jesus was called the King of the Jews in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek, almost as a sign of the pain of the people throughout the centuries. The world is a place of suffering. When we have friends who suffer, children who are sick, 
when our cities cry out and suffer and long for justice, when men and women who serve this country find themselves longing for a home and missing family, when people cry out for want of food, when refugees have their encampments engulfed in flames, who, who can counter, who can balance, who can bring some meaning, who can bring renewal, who can plumb the depths, who can understand, who can comprehend the kind of suffering in the world today? in our own bodies, in our own families, in this community. If God had not experienced the depth of suffering in the world, then suffering would be a uniquely human phenomenon, a phenomenon that God could then not understand, could not comprehend, could not salve and heal. If Jesus did not suffer on the cross, then how could we as people who long to heal the divisions and the injustices of history move forward with any sense of justice? How can we have justice and grace for the great sins of our country, the great sin of slavery, and of the genocide of the indigenous peoples without a God who pays the price of suffering in the world fully in his own being, who by his own suffering, his own crucifixion, his own death, becomes the basis of grace, of justice, and of a new reality. Was it necessary that Jesus suffer? What would the world look like with a God who could not or did not or refused to suffer? An aloof God, a transcendent and beautiful and yet distant God. No, on this day especially, we as people of faith recognize that the suffering of Jesus Christ is instrumental to our own salvation and the salvation of the world. And so with humble hearts, with contrite souls, we pray to our God. And we remember the cost, the price that he paid.
This is the cross, the held Savior of the world. Come, let us worship God. This is the cross that held the Savior of the world. Come, let us worship God. This is the cross that held the Savior of the world. Come, let us worship God. O oh, my people, O oh, my church, says Jesus, what more could I have done for you? Answer me. Jesus says, I led you out of slavery into freedom and delivered you from the waters of rebirth, but you have made a cross for your Savior. Have mercy on us. Forty years I led you through the desert, feeding you with manna on the way. I saved you from the time of trial and gave you my body, the bread of heaven. But you have made a cross for your Savior. Have mercy on us. I led you on your way in a pillar of cloud and fire, but you led me to the judgment hall of Pilate. I guided you by the light of the Holy Spirit, but you have made a cross for your Savior. Have mercy on us. I planted you as my fairest vineyard, but you brought forth bitter fruit. I made you branches of the vine and never left your side, but you have made a cross for your Savior. Have mercy on us. I gave you a royal scepter, but you gave me a crown of thorns. I gave you the kingdom and crowned you with eternal life, but you have made a cross for your Savior. Have mercy on us. I struck down your enemies, but you struck my head with a reed. I gave you my peace, but you drew the sword in my name, and you have made a cross for your Savior. Have mercy on us. I opened the waters and led you to the promised land, but you opened my side with a spear. I washed your feet as a sign of my love, but you have made a cross for your Savior. Have mercy on us. I lifted you up to the heights, but you lifted me high on the cross. I raised you from death, and you prepared for me and prepared for you the tree of life, but you have made a cross for your Savior. Have mercy on us. 
I grafted you into the people of Israel, but you made them scapegoats for your own guilt. You have made me a cross for your Savior. Have mercy on us. I was hungry, and you gave me no food, thirsty, and you gave me no drink, a stranger, and you did not welcome me, naked, and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison, and you did not visit me, and you have made a cross for your Savior. Have mercy on us. <laughs> 